Uh, thank you, Susanna, very much uh, for the uh, for, for this welcome, and also, um, yeah, we are very happy to be here in as part of the working group for archives of CF as, as the first webinar. Um, so I will begin, then Tom will continue. I will close probably. Um, our talk basically stems from from ongoing research from the past year. Uh, one thing, since I can't see any of you, uh, then if there's something going on, then just shout. Anyway, um, it is based on documentation from the 70s carried out within the Folklore Research Center at the Hebrew University, which we digitized and decided to renegotiate in a renewed fieldwork carried out uh, in a community setting. Now, the Folklore Research Center, or for short, let's say the FRC, belongs to a long tradition of folklore archives dedicated to Jewish culture. So we begin here by explaining its uniqueness in this history. Um, just a minute, oh my God, this is so complicated. Never thought it's gonna be so complicated for me. Anyway, yeah, sorry. Um, we then delve into specific materials that we engaged in. I would say multimodal material that related to Yemeni folklore and expressive culture. We then tell the story of this re-encounter. Our renewed interest in this material surprised us in different ways, which we wish to get your feedback on, namely in relation to questions of media, and more important, uh, the very idea of credibility and truth of folklore material that was archived and revealed again. Jewish folklore was archived in different repositories in many places over a long period of time. The construction of tradition archives in the study of Jewish culture reflects the many discontinuities and ruptures in Jewish life in the course of the 20th century. Perhaps the first systematic tradition archive that also documented Jewish folklore substantially was the one compiled by Walter Anderson, the famous German Estonian scholar uh, of the Finnish school. Anderson, with the assistance of Jewish pupils in high schools in Minsk, managed to collect a few hundred oral stories that were transcribed by his pupils and were added to his own collection that included material in Estonian, German, and other languages. This archive was burned down when the Soviet Red Army entered Königsberg, which in our precarious uh, times is a reminder of the material basis of folklore collections and their fate in times of war. And I think this is an apt moment to pause and express our solidarity with our Ukrainian colleagues. At the same time, we also wish to extend our support to the Russians, ethnologists who even dared standing against the current atrocities, risking their own lives as well. We think it is significant that Anderson, a non-Jewish German, was perhaps the first to systematically document Jewish oral stories in Yiddish. It demonstrates the way our scholarly discipline typically associated with narrow-minded politics can also build many bridges. Anderson guided the founders, founders of the new institution that was constructed in nearby Vilnius in YIVO, the Yiddish Wissenschaftliche Institute, the Yiddish scholarly institution. YIVO formed a network of collectors or zamlers and uh, was and still is perhaps the most impressive archive of Yiddish folklore from before the Second World War. Various scholars accumulated their own collections and archives. Perhaps the first concerted effort to create a folklore archive in uh, Israel, and then in Palestine, was carried out in response to the Shoah by the Yeda Am Society, which is literally the Society for Folklore. This society was very much dedicated to collecting everything that vanished, and it is perhaps not surprising that it lacked a clear, sustainable organization of material. The first systematic folklore archive in Israel was established a decade later upon the return of Dov Noy, um, whom uh, you can see now in, on the slide, uh, upon his return from his PhD, which he can, had carried out under Steve Thompson at Indiana University in the United States. Having been trained in folk narrative studies, Noy formed the Israel Folktale Archives in 1955 in the city of Haifa, in a newly formed Museum of Ethnology. In fact, Noy taught at the Hebrew University Department of Hebrew Literature, not folklore, 
But so all of his folklore activities he initially based there at the Haifa Museum. In the Haifa Museum, no established research on all traditional aspects, or at least many traditional aspects. The folktale archive was the best known result of this, but actually Noy's vision was wider than the narrative focus of the Israel folktale archives. Under the roof of the now extinct ethnological museum, it doesn't exist anymore for, for a while now, he himself launched the, the, the Israel folktale archives, which is named after him today, a unique endeavor to document stories from different Jewish ethnic groups and local Arabs. His brother, his brother Meir Noy, the sole survivor of the Shah of the family that once lived in Kolomea, now in the western part of the Ukraine, began his project of collecting Yiddish folk songs. Another figure, uh, Giza Frenkel, originally from Poland, launched her project of documenting Jewish paper cut traditions, so material culture. Aviva Muller Lancet began collecting Jewish traditional dresses. So the Haifa Museum, I would say, uh, was quite an immense institution for, with different, with diverse uh, interests and different collections, but it, it disintegrated bit by bit. The IFA, the Israel Folktale Archives, was encompassed into the newly established Haifa University, where it is housed for the past 40 years and still going. It was added to the UNESCO Memory of the World list a few years ago. Meir Noy's unique collection of Yiddish folk songs is housed in the National Library Music Archives in Jerusalem. Aviva Muller Lanz's collection of folk dresses formed the basis of the ethnological collection of the Israel Museum. Once Noy established himself within the Hebrew University, he managed to form in 1970 the Folklore Research Center, the FRC, a research institution within the university soon followed by a minor program in Jewish folklore studies, which was later expanded, expanded to a full-blown degree by his student, Galit Chazam Rokem, which I imagine you also know. The FRC was from its inception dedicated to types of folklore not managed by all these other institutions in Israel, which may explain its foki, which is both diverse and may surprise um, and, and diverse and may surprise some for what it does not include. That is, initially, the FRC was not dedicated to the collection of folk narratives or folk songs or material culture, because these were all covered by the other institutions. The FRC was launched with a position granted to Dr. Issachar Ben-Ami, um, who became its director under the academic supervision of Noi. Whereas Noy continued managing the IFA, the Israel Folktale Archive at Haifa from afar, other duties within the FRC were carried out mostly by Ben Ami, who presided over the following projects. Audio recordings of life cycle traditions, mostly burial traditions and marriage traditions, and, but other uh, traditions as well. Some audio recordings of stories, not much, but there were a few, or there are a few. Eight millimeter film documentation project of ethnic folk dances carried out by a few dance enthusiasts, written documentation, folk medicine, still photography of year cycle celebrations, as well as folk dresses. In the 1980s, Galit Khazan Rokem launched within the FRC a proverb documentation initiative on cards, and later it was digitized, or some of it was. Chazam Rokem, under the impact of the new perspectives of revolution uh, in, from the early 70s, emphasized context and the way proverbs were actualized in real life situations. In addition, Chazam Rokem acquired complete collections. The human newspaper collection of Yaakov Tzitkoni. I don't know if you can see this picture. Uh, yeah. Uh, the Yom Tov Levinsky Wandering Jew collection some personal libraries and archives of different folklorists, among them the Raphael Patai Library, the Giza Frankel Jewish Paper Cut Collection, which was then taken over by Olga Goldberg, who already retired myself. As a new millennium took swing, the Hoffman Judaica Postcard Collection of 7,000 cards joined the FRC, followed by the Jakobson Ephemera Collection, the Ralph Perry Palestine Postcard Collection of 2,500 postcards, and lately, the David Pillman Holy Land Postcard Collection of 150,000 cards, which keeps me out of mischief, as my dad would say. Interviews conducted by uh, Professor Agar Solomon are also added to the archive. As you can see, the FRC consists of material of many different forms, media, and it reflects the different interests 
of the different researchers affiliated with it. The material that we focused on is the earliest contained in the FRC, and it is a result of the work of Issachar Ben-Ami. Ben-Ami himself was born in Casablanca in 1933. He studied in Göttingen in the second half of the 1960s. I would say he's probably one of the first students of Israel to go to studying in Germany for a PhD after the Shoah. He wrote his PhD under Kurt Ranke. Ranke is famous for his role in establishing the ISFNR, the, the International Society for Folk Narrative Research, and uh, infamous for his terrible role in the SA and the com his commitment to Nazi ideology, which he managed to escape partially by internationalizing his work later. So ben of course, had no idea of that past, but this might explain how Ranke managed to support him and his PhD uh, project on marriage customs of Jews from Morocco. ben work over the years, mostly in the 70s and 80s, focused on Morocco. By 2000, he completely left the field and joined a legal firm that focused on intellectual property, so no connection to folklore, and that it may explain why we never met him in kind of conferences, etc. and he passed away in 2015, before we began this project. Importantly, the 1970s material of ben -Ami was not known to many outside the FRC. Few people in the folklore world knew it existed. It was housed in the center, hundreds of audio reels, only with a little a title uh, about the type of material, many other photographs and films, all there inaccessible technologically to researchers with content that was almost unknown. This might explain the fascination of ours. There is something of a discovery in returning these reels, these um, yeah, uh, Revox reels into digital life. In the past couple of years, as we started digitizing some of the material, we were immensely surprised by the quality of the work. To be sure, most of the material related to the customs of Jews from North Africa and also Kurdistan, like Jews from Persia or Iraq, but there was also some material that related to the Jews from Yemen, Hasidic Jews, as well as material collected from non-Jewish communities, mostly Bedouins in the Sinai Peninsula, or Samaritans, there's a small Samaritan community, uh, uh, two small co communities uh, in Palestine and Israel. Uh, so now, uh, Tom, um, um, the floor is yours and you can continue from here, <laughs> take, take it from here. Thank you, Danny. Do you hear me? Y yes. Yes, good. So um, before we focus on the Yemeni material found at the FRC, uh, we wish to contextualize this material in the history of the ethnography of Jews from Yemen. Um, Yemeni Jews were studied from the late 19th century and were viewed as authentic representations of the biblical Hebrews. Uh, the first scholars, such as Yaakov Safir, ventured to Yemen for their fieldwork. However, from the turn of the century, as Jews from Yemen migrated to Palestine, scholars such as Avraham Tzvi Idelson, which by the way, was the writer and composer of the famous song Havana Gila, if you know it, and particularly Erich Brauer in the 30s, developed an approach of doing ethnography from afar, interviewing informants in Palestine, asking them about their lives as these had been practiced in Yemen. In that sense, the actual interaction in their interviews with Yemeni informants was subordinate to the story of life in Yemen. And so there is very little reflection on the actual production of ethnographic knowledge in the present in Palestine and later in Israel. This ethnographic style continued for a few decades and it changed gradually, mainly from the 1990s to the present. However, the interviews carried out in the 70s by the scholars at the FRC were still based on the assumption that what matters is the culture of Jews as it had been performed in its true or original surroundings. Scholars and students working at the FRC interviewed and documented older members of the community in different small villages in Israel, hoping to reconstruct Yemeni folklore holding to what Alan Dundas called uh, the devolutionary premise of folklore studies. 
In contrast to reconstructing the culture in Yemen, our interest was very much driven by reconstructing life in Israel in the 70s. Our interest focused on knowledge production processes in that time, accounting for the, for the biases of scholars and the perhaps implicit messages Yemen informants transmitted in such interactions. In retrospect, and if we are honest with ourselves, we initially shared with the scholars of the 1970s, the idea of sacrificing the ethnographic present in order to reconstruct a recent past. The Yemeni material that was kept in the FRC archives included audio recordings of songs, music, customs, folk medicine, and folk narratives, eight millimeter dance films and no sound, with no sound, written documentation of folk medicine, still photographs of material culture and customs. These were collected as part of two main research projects, the Israel Ethnic Dance Project and the Yemenite Seminar. And I will uh, explain shortly uh, about these two. So the Israel Ethnic Dance Project was led by Pamela Squeers, a folk dance researcher and aimed to document Israeli folk dances. We interviewed Pamela through Zoom as part of our attempt to understand the footage. Pamela returned many years ago to the US where she lives today. And we appreciate her, uh, her uh, help uh, in our uh, research. The project engaged mainly ethnic dances, meaning dances that were documented from communities of Jewish immigrants from Muslim countries like Yemen or Kurdistan, Iraq, Morocco, and from ultra-Orthodox communities originating from Eastern Europe. While the obvious goal of the project was to document and study these dances, its declared perspective was also to revive ethnic dances, inspired by the project initiator, Gurit Kadman. You can see her, she's sitting third uh, from the left. Uh, and she had a great impact on the project's actions. She was uh, an immensely important choreographer in Israel who immigrated from Germany in the 1920s. These two purposes, documenting folk dances and reviving them, were achieved by creating local folk dance groups. In the Yemeni case, about 10 groups were established. The process of establishing the, the group was also carried out by Kadman while the organization of the documentation and research was carried out by Squeers, assisted by Cyril Foreman, both of them from originally from the US. Um, Kadman did not study Yemenis who lived in cities, but rather focused on doing ethnography in rural contexts, where she assumed community fabric resembled life in Yemen. She was usually accompanied by a Yemeni translator, who mediated between her and the men and women she met. Miriam Khubara, one of her uh, uh, informants and one of the dance group le leaders told us of the way Kadman approached her and asked her to assemble the village women to form a dance group. And I will, I will quote from her uh, in interview. You can see it on the screen. Um, Gurit Kad Kadman, may her memory be blessed. I loved her very much. We did not have our folklore group yet. She came to me and said, I want it to be vivid. What does it mean to make bread? What does it mean to be a bride in Yemen? So I told her, look, I have these elderly women here. They have experience and I am trying to follow in their footsteps. We conducted our first rehearsal in the Ashkenazi or Western Jewish kibbutz. Okay. So the folk dance groups performed in festivals such as the Boy Teman Festival in 1973 in Tel Aviv <clears throat> and were documented by the researchers of the FRC in eight millimeter films and still photographs. While the music was recorded separately, four films of different Yemeni dance groups are stored in the FRC archive along with parallel photos and sound recordings. The second research project was the Yemenite seminar in 1975, one of a series of ethnographic surveys 
which operated in a peculiar way of bringing together 70 elderly informants to a hotel for 10 days and inviting researchers from various disciplines to interview them. The ethical implications of this form of ethnography notwithstanding, they yielded much material in diverse formats. And we now realize that most of Ben Ami's ethnographic material was collected in this manner. 40 years later, the social processes in Israeli immigrant society raised new questions of the nature of power structures in research and such dynamics. In addition, technological possibilities coupled with generous funding of the Badihi Foundation for the Study of Yemeni Jews allowed us to di digitize all the Yemeni material. We were now in the position of readdressing this material with new questions. And uh, our project included cataloging and digitizing the materials aimed to recontextualize the archive by adopting an approach of ethnography in the archive. This approach assumes that material in the archive is not preserved to be discovered, so-called, but rather it is constantly made and remade. Our ob objective was to initiate new connections between the archive and the Yemeni com communities documented in it, preferably including family members of the people documented, as we assumed all the people that appear on film or photo had already passed away. We were driven by an ethical commitment to share these unknown materials with the community they originated from and a research objective of gathering as much contextual knowledge about this ar archival material from living members of this community. We chose three communities we found documented in the archive and reach out, reached out to people and activists uh, in these communities. As our first community, we chose an agricultural village called Bareket in central uh, Israel. Mm, yeah, established by Jews from Haban, previously the most peripheral Jewish community located in Eastern Yemen, and hence displaying a distinct cultural variety in comparison to more central Yemeni communities in the west of the country. From the beginning of our ethnographic discovery, of their ethnographic discovery, the so-called Chabanis were considered the most exotic among exotics for their remote peripheral location in Yemen and therefore were the focus of numerous studies since the 1940s to this day. And it, it, it would not be an exaggeration to say that at any given moment, someone is studying something in Bareket. We chose the, this uh, com community for that very reason, because it was so intensely studied and because the community maintained its social structure and connections in a way that Chabani tradition and heritage is present in Bareket's daily life today. Another reason was my own personal contact. I had previously, I had previous acquaintance with one informant called Shemesh Efrati, you can see her on the, on the screen, who once had been a member of the Chabani dance group and who established her own private Chabani museum in her house. We contacted Shemesh and told her we have some old pictures and films of the Chabani dance group and that we would like to present these materials at her house to the people of Bereket. Shemesh uh, agreed and invited some of her friends and family members. And we invited some of Bereket's younger generation who are in some way active in the heritage of the place. About 25 people gathered at Shemesh, Shemesh's house. And we began with an introduction about the FRC. We gave Shemesh an album with copies of the photos as a gift. And afterwards, we began screening the materials with a projector along with a short introduction before each section. We presented photos of people and situations, silent films of dancing and some audio recordings of Chabani folk songs. As we anticipated, the audience was viewing the materials actively, naming names and telling some an anecdotes 
about deceased members, members of the community that appeared on the screen. Older members of the community were naturally able to add more details about events recorded 50 years ago. Furthermore, younger members of the community who are enthusiastic about their heritage were immensely knowledgeable about Chabani customs. Shemesh was the only one present that was a member of the original Chabani dance group from the 1970s and was seen as an authority for what we saw on the screen. One question addressed to Shemesh revolved, revolved around whether or not the dance presented on screen was real or a show. Just a moment. To which Shemesh replied, it was a show. Some reactions were critical. When we played sound recordings that were according to their archival record, Chabani folk songs, the listeners were quick to dismiss them as non-Chabani, saying the archive record was mistaken and only one recording was actual original Chabani song. The, the audience reacted critically to a film showing Chabani men and women dancing together on stage. Statements like, this is not our tradition, or a choreographer told them to dance this way were expressed. Similarly, upon examining a photograph of a woman from Bareket without, a head, without head cover, one participant explained that the photographer must have asked her to display her braided hair arrangement, and that this photograph does not portray an authentic representation of Chabani women. But these were not the only reactions to the material. When we presented the silent films, along with some remarks stated above, an awkward silence dominated the space. It was, as we realized later, almost unbearable to watch the Chabani folk dances, which was original, originally accompanied by live music and expressing vivid joy and dynamics in complete silence. And I'll just give you a small taste of uh, what we saw there. Okay, we did not anticipate the awkwardness of this situation that I, th I think also we experienced somewhat now. And indeed, the audience in, the bar in, in Bareket responded. On two occasions, all the members of the audience began singing a song they associated with the dance presented on screen. Shemesh started singing when the screen showed four women dancing. And she began singing while another asked her, do you think that is, this is the original song? Notably, Shemesh and her friends sang in perfect rhythmic correlation and coordination with the dancing bodies on film. And now we shall see, we shall watch uh, uh, the film with the new soundtrack recorded in our meeting in ba Bareket. And after which uh, I will hand over uh, uh, Danny uh, the rest of the presentation. Yeah, <laughs> 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 
Can you hear me, right? So, we would like to offer two reflections on this project and the renegotiation of archival material in Barakat. Uh, let's say <laughs> some thoughts, uh, afterthoughts. <laughs> uh, ethnographic imagination as well as traditional archives grew with increasing awareness and fascination of media. The introduction of recording devices at the turn of the 20th century was a novelty. Often it was used manipulatively by ethnographers as it allowed them to perform magical so-called things in front of audiences. Uh, in such ethnographic encounters, some could hear their voice, their own recorded voice for the first time, so we can imagine how magical it was. By the 1970s, of course, the recording device was already old news. As for photography, one should recall the fascination of color films that became widely used then. Perhaps a good example is Paul Simon's 1973 pop hit Kodachrome with the Amazing line, everything looks worse in black and white. In that sense, the use of eight millimeter color films by amateurs was revolutionary, almost magical. And I remembered myself as a child in the seventies. It became standard in ethnographic and performance documentation. Thus in 1976, Stephen Feld published an article in the journal Ethnomusicology noting that we find an abrupt shift from no statements on film at all to full-blown discussion of film production as a basic means for data retrieval. Ethnomusicologists were of course focused on the sound and the film offered an additional sense. But for those who documented dance, the film opened new horizons. Clearly the documentation of folk dance in the 70s in the, uh, in the FRC focused on the movement of the body and actually particularly the movement of the legs. In some of the films, not the ones that, uh, not the last one we saw, I mean, the, the focus is really on the legs. The lack of a soundtrack was a certain price they may have been willing to sacrifice. Yet it, it's, yet it seems that this was mostly due to limited resources because there were not no 16 millimeter films, for example. As Gorit Kadman reflected a year after the 1975 Yemeni seminar, and she's she, 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 and, and I'm reading the quote. The most problematic section of documentation is of folk dances. Probably the most accurate method is a synchronized filming of picture and sound. At this present seminar, we had limited possibilities. There were many gifted dancers, but there were only um, a few experienced folk dance researchers and limited technical equipment. Kadman used film er early in her career but the introduction of eight millimeter films as part of fieldwork techniques used by scholars of the FRC as early as 1970 was, must have been experienced then as a novelty, as opposed to the black and white still photography that they used a lot in audio recordings with a Nagra device, which by the, was then you know, the thing and was much more standard. For us, 50 years later, returning to the material, holding still photographs was not experienced as something out of the ordinary. In contrast, the process of frame by frame digitization of eight millimeter films, that's the way it is carried out today, was experienced as somewhat unique for us. Archival imagination can be triggered by unique items found in the archive, but can also be triggered in the encounter with old media forms. The metaphor of bringing back to life became very much present in our own experience. Even when one tries being critical of such habits, we know that our first reaction of watching a digita digitized eight millimeter film was of amazement and amusement. We smiled a lot in front of the computer screen. It is fair to say that joy characterized our initial viewing. In the second viewing, other feelings entered, emotions, but also interest in some questions crept. When was it filmed? Where exactly? Who was holding the camera? What was the purpose of the documentation? 
What was the broader frame of analysis that governed this form of documentation? All of this underlined some of our thoughts as to how the audience would react to this footage. We imagined how they would tell us about who are those that fil are filmed and perhaps even remember the occasion. We also thought it would be emotional watching people who are already deceased on film for the first time, perhaps. In short, we thought that our public duty would be fulfilled by sharing this message in a bottle, so to say, returning material to the people, but at the same time that our research questions would be addressed and that we would be able to shed light on the missing context. We did not take into account the social dynamic of watching a film together, which is reminiscent of going to the cinema, actually, much more than typical field work. We all have experiences in watching silent movies, I imagine. But in actuality, silent movies were never silent. They included soundtrack and, and probably a band. And even today, when one watches Buster Keaton or Charlie Chaplin films on YouTube, there, are, there is a soundtrack. That is, nobody expects one to watch a film in total silence together as part of a social event. Watching the footage together under these circumstances created a peculiar ethnographic moment, which we were not prepared for. The audience's reaction was probably the only apt one, creating the right soundtrack for that moment. Was that the original sound as one of the members of the community asked? Perhaps, does it actually matter so long as the music and the rhythm fit the movements on the screen? Indeed, the question of the credibility of archival material in this re-encounter is perhaps of more substantial importance. In an interesting reflection on archives, thinking more in relation to the role of historical archives, Thomas Osborn considers the archive as a principle of credibility. The discipline of history, Osborn notes, but we can replace history with folklore studies for that matter, places a premium on archival credibility. One can write about the past in many ways, but unless one is unable to generate archival credibility, one is not really doing history. Oh we can say folklore studies. In that sense, and relating to performative folklore, what is more credible than a film? Galit Khazan Rokem discussed the impression video recordings had made in the 60s on folktale research, actually when she presented them in Finland in the 60s uh, to Matikusi, particularly. Seemingly capturing the whole performance, but she noticed already then that even film recordings are partial representations of the narrated event. Reapproaching the FRC archive, we did not perceive it as the full story. It was clear to us from the outset that any translation of a performance to other media is based on profound transformations that amplify some aspects and at the same time contains lapses of knowledge and information. Indeed, we knew that we hold to partial truths, yet we initially thought that however partial, the credibility of our material, material is indisputable. After all, we began our inquiry by interviewing the ethnographers, taking into account what was behind the scenes, tracking the ethnographic moment and the production of ethnographic knowledge. Nevertheless, the actual scene was taken by us as relatively credible. We took for granted that the presence of a camera changes the perf performance, and as noted, the actual production of knowledge was based on an active intervention in the repertoire. In hindsight, we were naive and uncritical. We went the, with a digitized film in hand, holding a piece of archival material that had moved before from one shelf to the next. And after all this time, there we were, 50 years later, who were equipped with this knowledge from the past, knowledge of the past. We thought our material speaks to some form of truism. And with this new ethnographic layer, we would soon arrive at something more complete. I mean, complete in that manner. However, as we mentioned, the archive's credibility was questions, questioned time and again by the people of Bareket, who read against the archival grain, to paraphrase Anne Laura Stoller. The people of Bareket of 2021 are not the same as those captured on film in 1971, to be sure. The boundaries between religion and secularism are perhaps more pronounced today than 50 years ago. Their objections to the archival footage and their critical suspicion of it certainly reflects these societal changes. At the same time, they reflect the current zeitgeist. And I think this is for, for us, like for me, for us, a surprise. A zeitgeist which questions any source of information. So-called traditional media, such as the New York Times, 
epidemiologists, and photographic reports from the front lines. In these times, the academic belief in the credibility of archive was turned by our interlocutors over its head to a mere folk belief, almost a superstition held by old men who still believe in what they see or hear in the archive. Thank you.